All right, so we'll get started. Um, my talk is titled Automating Airflow uh, Backfills with Marquez. Uh, just for some context, I gave a talk in, back in 2018 in New York, and that really introduced the core model of Marquez. And at the time, uh, it, we were still flushing out the design and it was early phases of development. But one of the key classes of issues that we wanted Marquez to solve was backfills. So I'm really excited to walk you guys through what you're able to do with Intuition metadata that's stored on the market in, in the Marquez backend. Uh, but first, yeah, I'm Willie Luchuk. I'm in the Bay Area. I am a software engineer at Astronomer. I work on the data observability and lineage team. I'm the co-creator of Marquez so at WeWork. When I <clears throat> when I started there, I co-created the project um, and eventually open sourced it. And I'm also a committer to open lineage. Uh, before before Sharmer, I was I was at Datakin, so I was the founding engineer of Datakin, which it was a data lineage uh, startup where um, we kind of started the discussion around open lineage, and eventually um, that becomes a standard that I think a lot of really cool platforms and and tools are starting to to adopt. So really really quick, I think what I'd like to cover today was really backfills or sort of the naive way. Um, there are different, like I mentioned, there are different classes of back, uh, of, of data quality issues uh, or just issues in general that organizations have to deal with, want to deal with, and maybe not be capable to deal with yet. Uh, so I just wanted to go through kind of the core uh, concepts and generally the tooling that Airflow provides uh, to do backfills. Then I want to go into the open lineage spec, talk about the standard, the generally what the shape of the event is that's being captured and emitted by the integration that we do have with Airflow, and then talk about Marquez and how that metadata is eventually stored. And uh, I'll go through some pretty cool, I think some demos as well that others might find interesting that will walk you through the API, but also do some troubleshooting with the, um, with the Marquez UI with some DAGs uh, failing. And then I, then I want to revisit backfills, sort of do a take two. You know, now that you, now that you have lineage metadata, what can you unlock, and how are you able to query the lineage graph uh, to be able to then run backfills for your your Airflow DAGs that might be failing? And then I'm going to talk about some future work. Uh, really, there's some in Open Lineage in particular. There's been a lot of development and integrations that we've been working on, so I want to highlight those. And then I also want to talk a little bit about what's coming in future releases of Marquez. So as I mentioned, I was at WeWork and this was a talk that was based off a talk I did um, in 2018. So there'll be some themes, uh, one in particular about um, booking rooms. So I want, I have this hypothetical room booking uh, scenario that we'll walk through and then we'll eventually have some uh, airflow DAGs that we'll take a look at and we'll process room bookings. So let's get started. So the, the general flow of booking a room at WeWork, um, which I don't think has changed, is one, you kind of pick a location. So where are you located? And you pick a floor. Um, in this case, Salesforce Tower, because uh, I'm based in SF. And you pick the room size and also when you want to book the room. In this case, it's really far in the future. It's November 8th. So um, we're being proactive, which is exciting. Uh, then you want to select the open time slots that are there. So there's peak time, but there are some hours that are open from four uh, all the way to eight. Uh, so we do a selection uh, for our duration. And then we eventually confirm. So generally, those four steps book us a room for our team. Maybe we're doing like some hackathon or something like that. Uh, but yeah, we have a room now in Salesforce Tower. But really, what, this is a scenario that happens quite a bit, and one of the core businesses of WeWork was really to uh, understand where room bookings are happening and what locations are popular, so they could predict where the where where they would open up another office space. So our analyst our analysts really cared about which location had the most bookings, and this is kind of a very common question that happened. It's uh, you know which one is which office spaces in what regions are utilized the most. So really, we're looking for this uh, where you have a set of room bookings and you want to be able to produce uh, uh, some location ID. 
Uh, so find the top one in that set. And what happens a lot as a data engineer, you have a data analyst who will say, you know what, I have this query. And in this case, we're just doing a select, a really basic select on, on the room bookings table that gives us the location. We do a count on bookings and um, we also know who it was booked by. And then we do a grouping by that and just do a descending. So a lot of times what you end up doing here is um, as data engineer, you'll take that SQL, you might have to optimize it in some way, um, but for sure you have to one, run it on a scheduler. Um, and in this case, it's gonna be Airflow. You then have to define some DAX or some relationship of where your da input data sets are. And in this case, it's going to be the from the, the room bookings table and also where you're writing to. And in this case, it's not going to be that. We're, we're just gonna be feeding a dashboard. But I, I did wanna go quickly to uh, show you, you know, after you spoke with the analysts, you felt pretty confident about what the requirements were, and then you productionized it. You may have to have tweak the SQL a little bit because uh, that sometimes that might need to happen for some optimization. But I just want to show you, we do have this top room bookings by location, and we do have a DAG that looks fairly fairly similar, right? You, you have some, you give it give it some DAG name, use a Postgres operator, and you. In this case, we do a lot. We do an init. So in this case, if you, if the table, the top room bookings by location doesn't exist, it will create it for you. And here's generally the schema. We have some ID when it was created, location, uh, the bookings, and also uh, who it was booked by. So we have some customer ID that we'll, we'll be uh, referencing. And then in this case, we're just doing a truncate and we'll do an insert as well. So after we do, if we truncate the table, then we just kind of reprocess it. And this is very basic, but I just want to show you uh, generally what the pipeline looks like and there's a few others as well and uh oops, that's the marquez ui uh, what i wanted to show was uh this new room booking so it's it's ran already and what it's doing is just inserting some c data i didn't go too crazy on it i kind of threw in some values but the idea is you have the location the room what time it was booked on and uh, who it was booked by so that's generally the, the metadata that we're receiving with so we make this data available uh, through a top, um, I forgot what was, the, what was the name of it. Uh, the top room bookings by location and our analysts are pretty happy and they are able to do, a, uh, they were able to run a select on that table and just do an ordering and limit by. So the result was already there, but SF seems to be pretty popular. So let's change my scenario. Um, but DAGs do fail. Right, so this normally may be running for a couple of weeks or um, if you're lucky enough for um, a month. But within that, within that time frame, I'm sure there's, a, there's a scenario where I, a DAG could fail, whether that's because there's some code that you pushed in production, which is now causing it to fail, or there's an upstream dependency that uh, is no longer, uh, where it could be the job itself is failing or the, the data quality has dropped uh, which is the input to your uh, to, to your DAG. And if that does happen, then backfills are definitely a thing that you have to handle. Okay, so this is pretty wordy, but I think it's important to at least frame the definition of backfilling because everyone does them, but no one talks about them. I feel, you know, I, as I was kind of doing my background research on backfillings in general, you don't see a lot of discussions about them. So, uh, you know, as the, the one thing I did want to point out here is, you know, as your organization grows and scales up, um, the data data problems or data issues that you have to deal with or want to deal with um, or not yet uh, capable of dealing with is is really a big concern because you're as your company grows, there's different phases uh, in which you then have to start looking at different data sources themselves because uh, teams begin to depend on each other, um, data gets copied. And you want to be able to um, identify quickly if there is an issue in your pipeline that's now resulting in uh, data or data quality issues downstream. Um, and I think here, just in bold, you know, backfilling refers to the process of retroactively processing historical data. So there, you know, there it could be that you have a new pipeline 
uh, there's a new data source that you want to backfill, uh, that's pretty normal, and especially if you know that you want to backfill a month worth, worth of data before it actually becomes useful to analysts. But then there's the case where you know you do have uh, an actual production bug that now reduces the quality of your data. Maybe it's introducing nulls, or you have values that are no longer correct in, in the sense that you know it, it could be incorrect data. You know, random characters are being added or or something similar. So you want to be able to have a way to understand which pipelines and which data sets are affected by that. And the one way you could do that is by um, kind of having a central location to uh, store your metadata and understand dependencies between your different pipelines and the data sets that they produce and consume. So the different classes or the different type of DAG failures that you would, you'd see is one data quality. So when I say data quality, I'm talking about data freshness. And that could be incomplete data. So oftentimes, you, your pipeline is running, but it's relying on partitions. So if there are certain, certain partitions that are not yet uh, updated or the partition itself is not available for some reason, your data is no longer fresh, or your pipe maybe upstream dependencies are taking longer to process data, and data is arriving late. That's all part of data freshness, or could result in issues with data freshness. Then you have data schema changes. This is actually pretty common, right? Um, initially, you have a very small team if you're in a startup, and there's a warehouse with a couple of tables. But data changes pretty frequently, if not um, all the time. So columns get dropped, they get added. Data types also change, and Anytime that happens, you have to coordinate it. And let's say you do change that, or you do drop a column, how do you then notify other downstream dependencies that, by the way, this column needs to be um, dropped or the, the, the column name has been uh, renamed? Also, there's bad, bad code in general. So DAGs crash because bugs are written. I mean, I stopped writing bugs a long time ago. So for those, are still writing bugs, that's causing problems in your in your overall data platform. So you know it could be. I mean, most of the time it's going to be a runtime a runtime issue. So in that case, your DAG starts, it executes, and begins to crash. And then any other team that could be relying on that pipeline completing in a timely manner um, is now delayed, and that could overall most likely affect uh, dashboards that a CEO might be looking at. Excuse me, sorry. Um, then we have DAG dependencies. So this is more upstream. So if you were, if you have um, a, a DAG upstream that has failed, you then need to be aware of it somehow. Or if not, you're going to then be woken up middle of the night with a page of duty alert that, hey, your pipeline is now failing. And if you look at your code, you realize that there hasn't been a production and release in maybe quite some time. So it has to be in the input data set, which is something that you don't necessarily have a lot of control over unless you are uh, you have some data quality checks. So yeah, uh, you know dependencies upstream will definitely make your DAG fail if there have been changes in the data or uh, data is arriving late. So I say naive here, but honestly, you know Airflow does provide a pretty solid command line to do backfills. So if you've ever run this before, and I'm sure a lot of you have, it's Airflow backfill, and you give a start and end date, and then the DAG ID. And depending on which runs you're going to be reprocessing, uh, it will then execute the backfill. Uh, your code does, I mean, the one thing that's really important is you know your SQL does have to be uh, written in a way to understand uh, start and end time, uh, just because. If you are running backfills, timestamps are pretty important. Um, that's uh, it's able in that case you're able to slice your data and understand that maybe these customers within this time frame were affected by some bug and their data has to be either either reprocessed or uh, just updated uh, to insert values that are, that are missing. Uh, the execution date most likely was the biggest thing for me to understand about Airflow when I first started um, messing around with the scheduler and defining DAGs 
you know, I always assumed that I would set the execution date and it would start, but really what has to happen is a window, in this case, we have a, we set, it, we set the schedule to run every 24 hours, so once a day. So one day has to pass before the execution, uh, well, before the start date actually happens. So I think that's pretty important, especially when you're doing backfills to understand where, what data you're reprocessing or which data it, it is, uh, is corrupt. So here, yeah, we just have a, a span of a couple of days, but uh, this is important, especially for the backfill uh, command. So yeah, I, I want to quickly go over the different classes of problems that you or your organization might be equipped to deal with or has to deal with. So one is data quality failures. Uh, the one thing I mentioned uh, previously was input data sets. They are really out of your control. Unless you're using grid expectations or some data quality tool, that input, you have very little, I mean, you could you have some filtering, right? You could add some checks in your code uh, to kind of validate the input. Um, but often that, if you're just running SQL, you know, you don't necessarily have that type of validation. Although SQL itself does has those, you know, they have types, but uh, that will explode and, and fail your pipeline. Uh, so inputs, input data sets themselves uh, are really one issue that you don't really have much control over and communication is really important. And currently, if you have no visibility in your dependencies and all you see is an input data set, you don't know who to reach to and you don't know how often that data set, it changes, what's the schema, um, who's the owner, who, I, who do I reach out to if I am running into problems? And also, is this in, input data set that I have, how easy is it discoverable by other organ, other teams within your org? Um, and just questions like that. So what happens is, you know, Airflow retries, you could set a number of retries and you keep trying, but you know, that does come at, an, at a cost, especially if your code is not an impotent. So if you um, have a billing pipeline, that might be a big concern. So a lot of the time I do recommend that you, there are some checks in place for billing because you don't want to underbill or especially overbill your customers. So retrying does come at a cost and it's not free. Unless your SQL is kind of built, uh, designed in a way that it, it can be, or just a job logic itself. Uh, so as you do these retries, you kind of realize, well, hold on, it was an upstream dependency that failed. And now I need to consider how do I run a backfill for this, um, for my job, um, especially because let's say if I haven't been processing data for a few hours because it was really, I'm not, it wasn't obvious on who owned the data set and also uh, how, when did it change, what type of change it was. And so it would be helpful to have a diff of maybe of the changes that we saw in the schema, because often that's kind of what happens, uh, the schema changes. So if you're able to know the diff, you don't have to reach out to the team. So it'd be nice to just have some, some capability to look in, and to have you know, some visibility into understanding how that data set evolves over time especially if it's owned by a job upstream. So you do also have the case where you have multiple data sets, but also multiple partitions that you have to process. Um, in this case, you, you know, how do you deal with processing most of the partitions or most of the input data sets? One, uh, there, there is a issue there that you just can't process that data for whatever reason. Um, yeah, it could just be now that there's missing data, or there's just a bunch of nulls. Uh, so that has to be addressed. Uh, there's also bad code failures. So kind of what I mentioned before, for those of you still writing bugs, you uh, what you often see is one, you know, runtime errors are are caught, but they're the tricky ones are the ones that you push new code out and then the, the the DAG or has been running for about a week. And it's really it's not apparent until someone looks at a dashboard and says that looks kind of funny. Why do we see more signups or more room bookings than we normally see on a Saturday, uh, especially if it was a holiday and no one's in the office? So that could be quite a discrepancy. And it could be one, it could be the code, it could be the input data set that you're, you're um, using to calculate um, the values for that, for that dashboard. 
but it also could be your code. So that that's something very hard to track down. So it would be nice if we were able to do a diff on the code or just understand anytime I push code out, I know that there will be this helpful pointer to the code that will allow me to do a diff and understand what changes uh, were part of different deployments. And don't, don't forget about your customer. So your customer is your downstream consumer of your output data set. And they're now being woken up because there's some issue with the output data set that you're now producing. So yeah, it, being able to understand your upstream, but also understand the downstream dependencies that um, are on the output data set that you are producing is pretty important. So backfilling is tough uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one, we, we kind of talked about uh, you know, quickly identifying data quality issues. And if you do see issues, how do you then begin to explore them and troubleshoot them and eventually resolve them? What alerting rules should be in place? So this one, you know, if your DAG is failing, how do you notify other teams or how can they be, how can there be a self-service way where the teams are able to say, you know what, there's a DAG failing that's upstream and I don't have to worry about it just yet. And I could pause my DAGs or I could go back to sleep if PagerDuty woke up and know that there's a team on it. And so I think that's really important. Um, you know, the being able to track run states and store them somewhere in a central place that you could query can really be beneficial to build some sort of alert system. And sort of the, the last one is really what effects uh, are there on upstream and downstream dependencies uh, for DAGs. And, you know, if, if, if there is a delay in how data is consumed, how will the data, how will the DAGs downstream be affected by that? You know, you, you see this a lot when there's a DAG that's processing more data than normal. I mean, that could be for different reasons. It's processing data that's duplicated or there's actually a big spike in traffic to your website. And naturally you're gonna have more, more data to process. So how do you begin to answer those type of questions? Like, is it because there's a bug or uh, the data itself is just, there's just more of it and you need to scale up your, your pipelines? So yeah, backfills, they're hard and I, they, it really shouldn't be. Um, what, I, what I wanted to first do is introduce open lineage. Um, and I think this gets us a pretty, this gets, gets us in a very good position to start answering and solving some of the issues that we talked about. Uh, so open lineage, it's a standard. And what you currently see in the current environment is that you have different tooling, different schedulers that integrate with different systems. And there's no standard yet, or at least there wasn't prior um, uh, as it will, yeah, until open lineage. So I, I think there were discussions of other standards as well, but there wasn't really a uh, one standard that uh, ruled them all. And uh, here we kind of see what the integrations look like. You know, Marquez has to integrate with a data warehouse and then a scheduler and then the data analyst tools that are out there. And, you know, same thing for Nigeria, Amundsen and Atlas. And there's, a, there's many others as well. But what if you were able to use a standard that would emit a lineage information for a job under execution? And then all those different systems would then be able to um, process those events and build out the, the lineage on the back end and store it. Uh, that way you're not tied to the life cycle of the um, of the tool or the scheduler because version changes do happen. I mean, version bumps do happen, code changes, and it's really hard to keep up. So integrations are one way to solve it, but if the actual system itself is able to emit those events and you'd be able to kind of keep, not have to worry about every release that, that comes out and make sure you're compatible. And I know there's been a lot of talks as well uh, at the Airflow Summit by Ross and, and a few others that talk about open lineage. So I'm not gonna go deep in here and talk about the standard, but just know that um, it, it does provide a really nice way to describe the way that meta, the, the metadata for a run and its inputs and outputs and data sets, and it's easily extendable through facets. So there's a lot of information that can be stored and most likely will continue uh, to capture more and more information, especially about the runtime of the environment 
uh, that your job is under and a few others, but it's a, it's definitely an interesting standard that is event-based and uh, it provides a lot of information and a lot of really cool tooling uh, that's built on top of it. And one of those, one of those services is Marquez. So before, you know, I go, yeah, before I go deep into that, I mean, I guess Marquez has been around for a few years now and it was started at WeWork and before open Linux, there was Marquez and Marquez, Marquez's data model will look oddly similar to what you see in open lineage, but where Marquez differ, uh, differs is that it's the, uh, implement, it's the implementation of, of open lineage. There's different backends that are implementing open lineage, but Marquez has a unique way to process the events. And what it ends up doing is applies versioning logic on the events that are being processed. And really quickly here, you know, you, you kind of look at three different use cases for Marquez. Uh, the one that's really important for this talk is data lineage, um, being able to track dependencies of your pipelines and the data sets that they produce and, and consume. There's data discovery, so being able to catalog data sets and jobs and make them searchable through the UI, but also an API. And then data governance, so really understanding what jobs are touching what data, does that data have PII, and should they be accessing it? At a high level, you, Marquez is a central metadata management system. Um, it's an open source project that has a few entities that it cares about, uh, sources. So where is the physical location of your, of your data sets, uh, like tables and Kafka topics and things like that. Uh, the data sets themselves, so metadata around the schema, um, how often it's refreshed, you know, what run produced that data set and there's versioning as well. And for jobs, it's understanding what are the inputs and outputs of that job, and also capturing run level metadata, which is really important for open lineage. And the features that we talked about, data governance, uh, lineage, and discovery. But you are able to emit those, that information through uh, REST call, which is uh, to a lineage endpoint, and that metadata is then eventually processed and stored in the core model, and then you have all these different APIs that you're able to then call and make use of that. So the if you recall the open lineage model, you saw jobs, data sets, and um, and runs. Uh, so you do you do see that here, but the relationship that Mark has keeps on the back end is you still you saw those job to data set uh, relationships, but relationships exist through job versions. So job version is when your code changes. So we capture like the GitHub link or just a link to code. If your inputs and output change or there's some context that you're sending along with the job that will result in a job version. And then job versions themselves are used to create runs. And that's how we keep the relationship between runs and the input and output data set versions. So when a job runs, it has an input data set version. And when it completes, it outputs a new data set version. And there's different sources that we support, like MySQL, Postgres, but you know, there I think the list is kind of growing. I mean this is a the slide's a bit old, but um, there's a lot of different sources that we, we support now. So what are the benefits of the job uh, of the design? Uh, one is debugging. So a lot of the scenarios that we talked about earlier, you know what the, the case where you produce a new version of the code, you deploy it, and a week later, you start seeing issues uh, downstream, especially like dashboards. So the question is, what job version produced and consumed data set version X? So that's really important. So if you know that a job version consumed a data set version that you produce that is now, um, it, it, it's now corrupt in some way or, you know, you don't, you want to backfill. Uh, how do you know which jobs to backfill themselves, but also which teams to read out, reach out to, to let them know after version X, you have to start um, either deleting the data itself or uh, updating it uh, partially. So yeah, it's really, really, really helpful debugging uh, model. And then the other one, uh, which, which we're talking about in terms of this talk is backfilling. So you can do full or incremental processing so full is where you're wiping all the data and starting from scratch or incremental where you might be 
backfilling just a subset of your customers or just one customer or maybe just some partitions that are in S3 or cloud stores and you partition it by day, uh, you might want to do that incrementally. And metadata is pushed to the API via REST call, so those open image events, and eventually uh, you decide that, you know, I want to try this out, and you look at one of our integrations, and we have Airflow, we have Spark, we have DBT, and all those work um, off the shelf, and we'll begin to emit lineage metadata to the markets backend. And in a nutshell, your workflows run, you use the open lineage uh, library and it populates the Marquez model. And what that's what that, so you see that for, we have support for Daxter and for Airflow. So a lot of the execution um, that happens begins, we have all these different extractors that emit the event in the standard that could be processed by um, a backend that's essentially open lineage compliant. So really quick with the integrations. So if you want to start looking at least uh, at Airflow and you want to start capturing lineage metadata for a DAG, what do you get out of it? Um, you get the task lifecycle. So when a DAG runs a different task, they have different run states. So we're able to capture if a task completed, it failed, the input parameters. And those are really important for debugging, especially if you're passing in a flag or there's an email. Um, and maybe there's a set of tasks that are failing for some parameter. It'd be helpful to understand and debug those particular tasks and understand why they're failing for that parameter. Uh, at the end, you have the link to the code. So your job runs and the code is versioned, which is great. And you're able to then do a diff in version control just to understand what changes happen from one code change to another and which one is deployed in production. And of course, you get the input and output. Uh, uh, data sets. So then we have the lineage component. So this is where you track interdependencies between DAGs. So you do have that with Airflow currently with you know, sensors. So you could kind of say, I'm waiting for this DAG to complete before I execute, uh, which is an option, but that only gets you so far. What if you have multiple Airflow deployments and how do you establish the dependencies between the DAGs? Or maybe you just want visually to understand what DAGs uh, you depend on, you won't be able to get that outside of just a single Airflow instance. So uh, this will cut across deployments and you'll be able to then see the lineage graph for uh, different DAGs that are, are running. And then there's built-in SQL parser for input and output tables. You have link to code builder and these metadata extractors, which I'll go into briefly. So to enable it, uh, this slide's a bit old, but as of Airflow, um, as of the most recent Airflow version, you don't have to modify the import anymore. Uh, so officially, you can you can just uh, install the Open Lineage library, and everything will be enabled for metadata collection. So all the DAGs will have metadata extraction enabled, uh, which is really nice. But I think for this talk, I can I wanted to show more explicitly that you could change it for lower versions. And that was the initial uh, rollout. And what it ends up doing is just extends the DAG and adds these different hooks and applies different extractors based off the operator. And what I mean by that is you have an Airflow operator um, under the operators library, and then you then have the, equ the equivalent extractor to understand uh, how to process that operator, build out the event, uh, so job name, uh, parse to SQL, uh, register the source. All that information is embedded in the event and extracted by, in this case, a post, the Postgres extractor. And if we quickly go through, the, there's like different things that we care about. So you have the source, you have the analytics TB, you have the data set in here, which is the room bookings. It's the only input table that we have. Everything else is generated. And then you have the job name, which is new room bookings. Um, the one the one thing about the name is that we we do the task well we do the DAG ID delimited by a dot and then the task ID and you'll see that in the example that I have but I just wanted to point that out there's a certain convention that we adopted so once you have the 
library enabled, what you're able to see is two DAGs that seem to depend on each other, but you don't know how. And the way they're dependent on each other is through a table. So this public.roombookings table uh, contains just information about the rooms, the timestamp, and also the location of where the room booking happened. Uh, so this is just one case, but you can imagine if you have uh, hundreds of DAGs that are running and understanding the relationships between them and how are they related through data sets, that becomes super power powerful, especially when you're having data outages and you're spending weeks, if not months, to resolve them. And most of the time, you don't resolve them because it's hard to find every possible scenario where that data is being used unless you have some visibility. Okay, so what I wanted to do, I wanted to do backfilling take two. Uh, so I, I'm going to enable these DAGs and they're gonna run. <clears throat> and what I wanted to show, I wanted to show the Marquez UI quickly and look at uh, the WeWork namespace. And if you click on, let's see, calculate, here you go. So if you click on cal calculate, and before I kind of start, um, what, what's happening is those Airflow DAGs that are executing are using the Open Lineage integration for Airflow and just submitting uh, Open Lineage events. And the way, the way you kind of see what the information was is we do have information around the event and we do store the facets. So facets are a way to extend the model. And here you have the parent run. Uh, what was the relationship between the current run and the parent run? We have the run ID and that's what's being used to stitch all these different run IDs for a particular run. And you have information around the nominal time, what were the run args. And you also have the output data set. So this is captured automatically. And you see the schema, you see the types as well as if there were subscriptions, you'd capture that. But data sets also have facets. So there's a schema facet with the different names and the types, as well as uh, the data source. And the one interesting thing is we, like I mentioned before, the model does have version history. So you're able to then look at um, what the version was, what the ID was, when it was created. And I think we're still figuring this out, but you know, there's, we have a field count. So you were able to click on in, click on this case, uh, the only version that's there and you're able to see the model. And then same thing for the different jobs that are there. You could see the SQL uh, that's present, that's being executed. You have the DAG name, which is built customers for room bookings dot calculate. And you also look at the different run history. So this has been running for a little bit and they're all complete, uh, which is nice. And same thing for, uh, okay, this one's running, but uh, there's another top room bookings by location dot calculate. And they also produce their own output data sets. So the top room booking, it has its own uh, top room bookings by location table. And the one that's doing the billing, so this is a pretty important pipeline that is taking care of all the billing information for our customers and how much to charge them. Okay, so what I would like to do <clears throat> is, and the demo gods were not in my favor. Uh, so I had to do something to uh, make this work. Uh, what I what I first want to do is I want to change the new room bookings, and I'll go really quick into what changes I'm making. But first, let me just copy it here. I have a change directory. There's a DAG with the same name. I'll zoom in. Uh, there you go. Oops. Okay. So what that ended up doing was changing uh, changing the file for new room bookings. I'm going to trigger it, trigger it again, uh, and I'll show you the change that happened. Uh, if we go to the source code and we look at the code here, um, the one the one thing that we did was we just changed the column. I, it, this is one scenario that I, I talked about, but you know the, what you see often is that. Uh, a column is changed. It's not good practice to change it in the same release, but sometimes that does happen. Uh, we're not all uh, good engineers, and sometimes we make may make decisions because we need to get something out quickly. Uh, so 
let me rephrase, it's not that we're bad engineers. It's sometimes you have to cut corners to get out a feature in. You know, there are code reviews and things in place to make bugs uh, present in production not, uh, slower. Eventually they get there, but you know, you have all these processes, but sometimes you, you can't catch them all. Uh, so here we see that the, the column has changed. Uh, and if I go back to the UI, uh, let me go here, yeah. And I click on insert, you'll see that there are two runs. So, so the first run, if we look at the, it had booked by, I'm not sure if you can see that, um, but it had booked by. And if you're able to then go into the latest run, you'll see that now it's booked by customer. So on the Marquez back and it captured that there's two versions, um, but each run was based off different versions of the job. And the output data set itself, you'll see that there's also different versions. Now there's three because every time uh, you a job run completes, it creates a new version of its output data set. Uh, that's just assuming it touched the table somehow. But in this case, we also see that the schema changed. Uh, so this, even though uh, if I go back to a previous one, you'll see that it's booked by. So when we talk about the diff and being able to do a diff on both the code and also the schema, this becomes super interesting and something that you could use for um, possibly backfilling, but also just debugging data problems. All right, so we're out there. So what's going to happen is uh, we're going to start seeing uh, now we have DAGs that are failing, uh, mainly because the column changed. So if we go back and we look at uh, Marquez, we can see, uh, let's see, it should show up. Yeah, here we go. So what we'll start to see is that if we look at the run state. So kind of looking at this view, what you have, um, you're able to look at the run state for uh, our calculate task under the bill customer for room bookings. A DAG and it's failing mainly because if you look at the column that it's using, it's using book by, and that is currently no longer available. So if you look at the run history, it's been successful, and then all of a sudden it's starting to fail. And if you look at the, the top room bookings DAG, you also see that the calculate task has also started to fail, and mainly because it's using book uh, using book by. Uh, so this is where I have to use, I didn't want to do this, but in order to actually get, I just couldn't get it to work any other way, uh, which it was working before. So I'm going to do something really dirty. I'm just going to copy this sequel. So this is actually, we'll solve it. And I'm going to go to my editor here. And uh, this was for top room bookings, right? Okay, great. So I'm going to copy the SQL. Oh. Even copy pasta doesn't work. Okay, here we go. All right. So what's that's hap what's what you're seeing here is that it's using the book by uh, customer, and I do have to do something for uh, this to work up here, just because we're no longer creating a schema. <clears throat> we're now looking to see if the call makes this, and then renaming it on the fly because it makes the demo look nice that way. Um, changes, and then I do uh, okay, build customer. Uh, trust me, this is worth it. Oops. Um, yeah, and then same thing here. Okay, so those are going to start executing. I'll just do a refresh here. And by the way, I'm, I know I'm using a very old version of Airflow. Uh, yeah, that, that's just because some of my examples were using that, and I have not upgraded, and I should. But just wanted to point that out because I'm sure a lot of people were like, "Why are you on such an old version?" Uh, maybe I'm just nostalgic. That could be it. So this, this one's eventually going to succeed. Uh, so we don't necessarily have to wait for that. 
look at my run history. Um, so this one completed. Uh, the one that we eventually addressed, and if we look at the run, you're able to look at the booked uh, booked by customer column, which is now the correct one that's being used, and the job is now completed. And same thing for the run history. If you look at that, you'll, you'll see that the latest one is completed. And this one finally completed as well. So this one was for the billing customers. Uh, so now it's using the right column. Okay. Uh, sorry. All right. So this this was something that uh, I wanted to run, but I think what I'll do it just for for time. Uh, I'm going to just walk through it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to do, go over first was just the REST call for the Lineage API. Uh, so you'll see you're able to call the Lineage endpoint. And this is where you can start building out the dependencies of your DAGs. Uh, so we saw in the UI that you're able to see dependencies across DAGs and understand the input and output dependencies that you have for the data set. But you're also able to use the Lineage API to then query the Lineage graph and understand what are the downstream dependencies that you have? And um, there's a script I wrote that I wanted to show and what you're able to do with the backfill command with a lineage graph and then what you're able to then do uh, to do backfilling for uh, a slice of your data and all the DAGs themselves that now rely on that change and have to be backfilled. So if we do a, if we do a curl to our lineage endpoint and you give a node ID, uh, it doesn't show fully on the screen here, but the, we have two node types. There's jobs and there's data sets. And the, it's delimited by a colon. And in the middle, you have a namespace. So that namespace corresponds to, in the UI, if you know, I selected the WeWork namespace and that had all the metadata associated or, and grouped within some context. And WeWork happened to be that, but you could use teams, you could use environments. And that's just a way to um, uh, contextually group your data. And then what we need is we also need, as a, since it's a job node, you do need the job uh, name. In this case, we have bill customers uh, room bookings calculate. We're going to pipe that to JQ and do less. And what's returned is an array of nodes. And top level, you have a graph. And if we go and we look at the different information that's returned, and again, this is a lot, you're able to do quite a bit the lineage endpoint. The one important thing is the ID itself. So it's the ID, well, this is the data set, I'm sorry. Uh, so there's, what's returned is a node and the edges themselves show a relationship between the nodes as well. And it's going to return all the different nodes that are reachable from the job node that I, I uh, made an API call with. So here you have some data sets, but the, the model that Marquez has now is returning fields. It's returning physical name of the of the, uh, uh, of the data set itself, the name of the data set. So there's a lot of information here. But I wanted to cover the in and out edges. So the origin is going to be the job room bookings uh, calculate, uh, which is what, the, what I queried for. And then the destination is going to be uh, the wework.public.billing. So that's just showing that I have some, it's a directed from the job to the data set. So it's seeing that uh, it's produced by this job. And then so same for, okay, this is another data set. So I won't show that. I wanted to show, uh, and this one's a bit more interesting, right? So the in and out edges contain a lot more information. So here the insert all job is writing to this room bookings table, but the out edges, and if you remember, we had two jobs that were reading from the room bookings table. Uh, so it has outages to the two jobs that are uh, uh, billing our customers, but also producing the top room bookings. So with that information, I, I didn't go deep into the scheme itself, but just know that the node has an ID, has a data, and that could be their data set or it could be a job. And then you have your in and out edges, which then can be used to traverse your dependencies. And if I, I quit here and I do vim on the backfill, and I do have a blog post on this that you can run. And 
it will execute successfully. But I wanted to show you the more important thing is you, what you're able to do is that if you uh, go, to, let me do virtual mode. Uh, oops. Uh, let me go 35. And that was it. Then. So what you do is you get the lineage graph. Um, and here you can see we're doing a curl call on line 35 to the endpoint. And before that, we're building the node. So the, the one thing that our script, our script cares about is what is a start date and end date that you want to uh, that you want to backfill for, and also what is the the DAG? So what is the start DAG? Uh, it's like I want to back I want to backfill this my DAG, but this what this script actually does is it looks at the graph nodes and all the in all the out edges, and if they're jobs, it will run the backfill for those jobs as well, um, and also for the same start and end time. So we capture the parameters uh, for the DAG. <clears throat> Uh, or for the script in terms of when to start, when to end, and also what's the DAG ID. And then there's this very helpful back, uh, backfill downstream of. So when you backfill data um, or you run a pipeline for a backfill, usually you want to down, you want to backfill any downstream dependencies that you do have. Uh, so this is what that function is. This is what the function is doing. So you get the node ID. You get the edges, and I echo out the different edges. And what you do is you recursively follow the out edges until um, you reach the end. Uh, you can always add different breaks if you don't want to. If there's a certain depth that you might want to backfill for. But here, you, you end up just doing a for loop for all the different edges for this node. Um, you see if it's a job. You kind of want to, you'd want to skip the out edges if they're a data set. And you only care about the jobs. And then you get the DAG ID. So you have to do some splitting there in order to get the DAG, because the, the way the Airflow backfill DAG works is that you need to have the DAG ID um, and then the start and end time there. So this script is available on a blog, and I definitely will link it out um, with all the inform with, with the script itself uh, if you wanted to give it a try. Uh, so the reason I showed that is, you know, the for that billing, for that billing pipeline, um, even though we just modified the column name, uh, what if there was duplicates and we were overcharging customers? Uh, that script would have been very helpful uh, just to run it from uh, starting at the new uh, the new room bookings DAG, which generated the generated the uh, the the test data. So if it contained multiple entries and the billing information uh, for our customers was incorrect for some reason, or you had extra rows, that's an, using time, using the timestamp, you're able to then uh, run some backfills and, and clean up so that way our, your, the customers aren't uh, overbilled for room bookings. And what, what, I, what I really wanted to show with Open Lineage Marquez and the relationship that you have uh, in or established through the lineage API is one that you have a global view, and really this tells teams that you know you can own your own failures. So if if failures do happen, um, can you then begin to backfill or address those those bugs in your code or the the bug in the code that produced that malformed data? Can you address it and make everyone in the organization know? So if you're a team that's a, that's fixing a or, or fixing a bug, I'm sorry, a, a data outage, how do other teams know that you're now working on backfilling data and addressing some really, uh, you know, really important data outage? So being able to have that global view and communication across teams and be able to see, you know, someone actively is working on addressing some of our uh, data issues is, is really important. So what I, it's, it's you know, this slide is tiled titled fail collaboratively uh, because you do want to feel like you have a say in terms of where um, where how, how issues are spotted and how quickly someone could then uh, address those uh, those issues and also you want to do some coordination 
So, you know, efforts aren't duplicated. So if there is an, a data outage and you do have to run a backfill, is, is really someone else working on it? If not, you know, can I help them out? And I think that's really important when you have uh, a lineage graph and be able to then run uh, some backfill on the data that's corrupt. And really just empowering teams, so give teams power to resolve their own data outages completely. And when I say completely, I really mean completely. It's not just, oh, you know, there was a table and I know there was one or two jobs that depended on it and I notified the team, but really being able to say, I also ran the backfill and that team didn't have to have much involvement. And right now there's a lot of coordination that does need to happen and it shouldn't, it shouldn't be that way. So really empowering teams to own the, the full life cycle of the outage itself. And when you have post-mortems, usually you talk about, well, what was the outage? When did it happen? What was the time frame? What were the jobs that were affected? What were the dashboards? And being able to have a lineage graph to show the relationship between those data sets, but also the metadata that's stored around runs and the run args and uh, run states is super important. So I wanna end it with future work. The one thing that you did not see in the model was column level lineage and that's coming. I think as of zero, A2 uh, for open lineage, that's being, it's not part of that release, but I know that it's being worked on. And I, I think support for Spark is also in progress. So the way column level lineage will work is for open lineage, it's going to be per integration. So Airflow will have its own set of logic to pull column level lineage, same thing for Spark and so forth. Um, and then Mar on the Marquez side, we're working on adding column level lineage to the API and also to the model and expanding that. Um, job hierarchy and grouping, this is something that Mike Collado has been working on and contributing to Marquez and it's been amazing to see the contribution, but really being able to really establish job hierarchy so that you know that a, a parent run is has a relationship with its child run and being able to group jobs based off some context. So what you saw in the UI for Marquez, you saw the DAG dot the task name, but that's not really how you want to model it, especially if job gets renamed and it's now part, and since the naming is part or the, the grouping is part of the name, it's hard to do the renaming and now it becomes a new, a new job in the model, even though it was renamed. And the next thing that we're doing is the Flink integration. So very excited to begin to support uh, streams and versioning streams, but that's in the early phases. And if you're interested, definitely check us out. I just wanna say thank you. This was fun. Um, also be cool and take the Airflow survey at bit.ly Airflow survey 22. There's a lot of really good questions and I think that's gonna help us build a better Airflow product. And if you wanna to contribute to Open Lineage or Marquez, reach out to us on Twitter, check us out on GitHub and give us a star. And that was my talk.